Thank you for attending this breakout session. This session is filled with powerful information to help improve your health and empower you. Radio Free 102.3 KJLH. We are you. Welcome to the KJLH Women's Health Expo 2021 Mental Health Panel. I'm Dr. Curly Bonds. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. And I'm pleased and honored to be here with an amazing group of panelists that I'll introduce shortly. This expo uh, for mental health and women's health overall has been near and dear to my heart for the last several years. And I'm pleased to be here just as a narrator today, a moderator for a panel that's going to talk about some of the in-depth issues that all members of our community face, but specifically focusing on what women go through, their unique burdens, their unique accomplishments, and some of the challenges that all of us have dealt with through this pandemic. We know that COVID-19 has been accompanied by racial unrest, and there's been a lot of loss. There's been a lot of, I would say, changes in how we live life. And we're gonna address some of the mental health impact of that today. So without any further delay, let me introduce my panelists who are here with me. I see that we have Dr. Denise Shervington. Uh, Dr. Shervington is the Chair of Psychiatry at Charles Drew University, and she has had an, a, nom, a phenomenal intersectional career in public health and academic psychiatry. Prior to her time at Charles Drew University, she held clinical professorships at Columbia University and Tulane University's Departments of Psychiatry. She earned her MD at NYU and a Master's of Public Health in Population Studies and Family Planning from Tulane University School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Shervington. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have with us Dr. Catherine Smith-White. Dr. Smith-White is a colleague of mine and a supervising mental health psychiatrist for the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, where she is a active person in both clinical and administrative sections. She works for a variety of child and sometimes adult programs where she provides administrative oversight and clinical excellence. Right now, she's also working with our home team, which is the homeless outreach and mobile engagement team that reaches those clients who others have overlooked who are living unhoused. She also works with our clients in the North County child psychiatrist. She works as a trainer for residency programs and fellowship. She did her own training at LEC USC Medical Center and worked locally for over 13 years before coming to the department. I also wanna welcome uh, Theon Perkins. Uh, Ms. Perkins is a clinical program manager three with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, so also one of my colleagues. And Theon has over 31 years of combined medical, behavioral health, and clinical experiences as a registered nurse. She has worked extensively throughout LA County and is currently overseeing all clinical programs in the northernmost parts of our county and the Genesis program or the geriatric evaluation networks encompassing service information and support. Welcome to Theon and also Dr. Smith-White. So um, my job is to let this panel show their brilliance today because I am, as I said, just a moderator. I'm a guide through a conversation that's going to, I think, raise maybe more questions than it will answer. But I'm going to start us off with one question and you all can just jump in. I, I know this group of um, amazing women really well and I know they're not shy. So the first question, although COVID-19 is far from over, it seems that we are finally starting to see some light at the end of this long tunnel. What advice would you give to listeners about how to approach what's been called the new normal as we begin to return to life as we once do it? Well, I, I guess I can start. I mean, I, I would say, first of all, um, try to be mindful that this new normal is still going to be new. Um, so we're going to need to be flexible. Um, and realize that you know we're going to have to continue to rely on digital connections for a while. Um, you know, as far as healthcare and education and work, and you know, a lot of our commercial transactions and all of that stuff. And this is you know both good and bad. Um, hopefully, for for our health and safety, you know, the the digital stuff will continue to be useful. Um, but at the same, and you know, and it's also that can be bad though, if you're not as tech savvy as you know, your teenager or you know, somebody in your life like that. But um, hopefully, you know, many of us have teens or tweens who can help us help us navigate that, uh, that part of the world. Um, so, um, you know, but I think also that we need to realize that more than likely 
COVID-19 is here to stay. You know, it's going to be a while. And so even though we're going to, we're moving towards the new normal, it's going to be probably, we're likely to have to continue to get even if we get the one or two vaccines or whatever, one vaccine vaccination, we may have to get booster shots like the flu. So I think people need to sort of be aware of that, keep that in mind, keep up with all of their regular care visits. You know, if it's prenatal care for, you know, pregnant woman, if it's, you know, other vaccines, if it's their other medications, that sort of thing. I think that all those things are important, you know, and keeping up, you know, minimizing contact with strangers, uh, you know, that sort of, we, I think all of that stuff is still, we need to be mindful of that um, for the near future. Thank you. Well put. I would agree with um, Dr. Smith-White and I would say we need to proceed cautiously. Um, we don't need to just rush out and, oh, we've, I'm vaccinated and I'm back out there. Uh, no, we need to proceed cautiously. And as Dr. Smith-White has already mentioned, we need to take some responsibility for our own health moving forward. Um, COVID has hit um, the African-American community uh, relatively hard, um, and we have to take responsibility for our own health in terms of exercising, um, watching what we put in our body. Um, Dr. Smith White and I had a conversation last night about this, even just the food that we eat, you know, um, we need to not eat hot Cheetos and things like that. We need to, to really think about what we're putting in our body to become healthier, um, practice walking more, just things to, to make our own selves healthy um, as we move forward and, and just navigate this, this new norm um, cautiously. Um, again, just not jumping right back. Um, the party should not start. Um, we're, we're not having a, a stellar party next weekend just because um, the numbers are going down. So I think we need to be mindful of that. I agree, but you know, sister, we might have to fight over the hot nachos. I mean, the hot <laughs> cheetos. I don't know if I can give those up just yet. My my one little guilty pleasure, uh, Dr. Sherpington. Any thoughts about yeah. this? Yeah, I would just you know what my colleagues have said are you know total agreement. I would just add that we might have to shift our philosophy about life. Um, there, the oh, how we used to be will no longer be how we can be. And those who survive these kind of disasters are the ones who are just to what is the new, the newness or the difference between then and now. And so being willing to do what's necessary, as was said by my colleagues, but not mourning too much what had been. We will spend too much time in that phase and really embracing the possibilities of a new way of being. And so I would just recommend that we really think about our mental processes in this and recognize that, you know, our mind is here for our survival. And collectively, if we recognize that the past is the past, we learn from it, and we respond to the reality of now, I think we will make it. Thanks. I think that personal responsibility is a word that many of you touched on. And I think that even though the government or the world in general might say that it's safe, you have to evaluate that for your own circumstance because we're at different places. Not everybody has had access to the vaccine. We know that black and brown communities have lagged behind, although there's been a lot of work to do some catch up. But let me go into our next question. Uh, approximately 33% by last count of Californians have now received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. And we know that there are multiple vaccines out there, all are proven effective and safe. I want to emphasize that. Yet we know that the vaccine hesitancy or reluctance to get the vaccine is still a big issue in communities of color. What have you seen in the populations that you work with and what messages do you think are important to share and where do you think people are getting info about the vaccine? I know that this morning I sat in the barber's chair and it was an interesting discussion about, you know, me trying to tell him, you need to get in line for this. And I think you will, but, you know, not everybody's coming to the front of that line. So what are, what are people thinking about that? I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, again, Catherine and I had this conversation last night. Um, I think we need to begin to really have dialogue with our friends, our neighbors, our, our family members. Um, I was actually quite hesitant um, several months back and 
one of my cousins who lives in Florida is a gynecologist and she literally called me and said, I will get on the plane and come there and give you this vaccine myself if you don't take it. Um, but then she went through the science with it. And even though I'm a nurse and I understood the science, it took me a moment to just take a deep breath. And, and she said, it, you know, reality is you need to look at how many people have been um, dying because of this, this virus. And the risk factor from with the virus as opposed to the vaccine is, is just, it outweighs it. And um, that, those kind of conversations I think need to be had. I think we just need to talk about it. I think African-Americans in general are getting converse, having conversations, are getting their information from social media and things like that, but they need to, to reach out to their providers, um, other um, system to just start having some educated conversations about it. Um, I, I think that will will help. Um, and it's it's up to us to to go out and have conversations. Us who've been vaccinated to have conversations with other people and tell them why you did it and the importance of it. I guess and I mean, I can. Oh, were you going to speak? No, please, Dr. Sherman. Okay. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the concerns that, you know, we have heard in our community are understandable given the historical context of the African-American community in particular with the, uh, the medical and scientific community. You know, I mean, I, I think we all know um, the background of that and without going into all the, the gory details, um, you know, generations of, of all of that sort of all those things. Um, but you know, feeling undervalued and so forth, um, and and having also inequitable, you know, resources and 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 those things are are important. And I think that that has contributed to you know some distrust of this vaccine. But I think too, um, initially the information that was shared was maybe they were the medical community or scientific community did not communicate don't don't be as worried about this as 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 you are we've been using this technology for you know 15 years to develop this vaccine that's why it happened at light speed i think people have all this anxiety because they don't they think how how could they possibly come up with this vaccine this quickly um and in fact, the, the, the technology has been there for a while and they were able to utilize it to develop this vaccine. So I think that's really important for people to know and to, to educate themselves. And I mean, as Theon and I were discussing, you know, the younger generation is certainly savvy enough to, to get that information. But, you know, for some older adults, it, it may be, you know, they still may have that suspicion those, that, you know, and I think that, um, so I think talking and, and doing a lot of reading and talking to people, sources that you trust. Um, although, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't necessarily think that you can just throw a brown or black face and somebody's at, at them and they'll say, oh yeah, it's okay. Cause you know, but I, I don't think that people are stupid, but at the same time, I think that it is important that people that they trust it from their own community are modeling the behavior of going ahead and getting vaccinated and are who people that they trust are able to tell them, okay, no, this is the backdrop of what happened. You know, there were black and brown people involved in the development of the vaccine and this technology was pre-existing. And so they were just able to utilize it and, um, you know, make this vaccine, you know, much more quickly than they would normally have done in the past. Um, so I think that would help allay people's concerns if they have that kind of education. Um, and, so, but I think too, we just need to let people know, share with them, we hear you, we feel you. We were all there, you know, we all felt that way. I had, you know, hesitation as well, you know? Um, and, you know, I, but, you know, we had to really carefully reflect about it. We had to look at the statistics and see, oh my gosh, so many people are dying. Huge droves of us are dying. And yet not just us. I mean, everybody is dying from this. It's, it's the numbers are big. I mean, granted, now the numbers are falling. Thank God, in LA County, we're in orange tears, as we know. But, um, but you know, I mean, I personally had COVID. I was incredibly sick for you know two and a half weeks. I mean, I, I was not hospitalized, but I could not get out of my bed for two and uh, two and a half weeks. And um, you know, I know people who who've died. I know people whose friends have died. 
and family members. And, um, you know, I think that it's important for people to know that, you know, doing this, taking this on, really talking about it and thinking about it, you're doing something that's good for you and also for your, your, your units, your, you know, family unit and, and your, you know, community and your, your work space and so forth. So all of that is really important. So, you know, because of all of our risk factors that, you know, we could go into, um, I think Absolutely. that it's really well, important. Well, thank you so much for sharing your personal experience. And you raise a couple of really great points. One is that even though you had COVID, you still got the vaccine. And I think that's important for people out there who might think, hey, I'm protected because I've had this, but we don't know that it grants full immunity. And so getting the vaccine is very important. Another thing that you raised is different resources. And I think both you and Theon talked about where do people go? I would argue that the best and trusted resources are those that are vetted by the scientific community or by the government, the CDC, the Department of Public Health for LA County website, those are resources. The Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health has COVID resources on our webpage and we'll make sure to get those uh, to those who are curating this program so they'll be available in either the chat or next to this presentation. Dr. Shervington, I don't wanna leave you out of this conversation. I, you know, I certainly agree that the history and we could go back from in psychiatry if you if you were enslaved and you tried to run away you were considered crazy <laughs> and you had a disease from the experimentations on black women to perfect certain obstetrical um, procedures to what we all know Tuskegee to the AMA um, refusing to want us to have insurance, all these histories of health inequities. One of the things they don't tell us is that who introduced the science of vaccination to America was an enslaved person who took this practice from Africa and it existed in other places in the non-Western world. And I think that made me feel better because if my ancestors from long ago knew that this was something that could stave off illness, introduced it to Europe. People were dying in the Americas and Europe from smallpox. And when they introduced the inoculation that we call vaccine, people lived. And of course, this gets taken away from us. And we think that it's Western science that's created this, and it's not, it came from our indigenous ways. So I think that's something we need to add and buffer all the negative experiences we've had systematically in America since 1619. Um, yeah, and, and I think we should also, you know, those of us who are lucky, we're healthcare practitioners, we understand about the FDA and clinical trials and, you know, we might understand warp speed a little bit better than people who are not in this field. So I think it's really important, as was said, that we, those of us with scientific knowledge and those of us who are trusted, we should really explain these concepts in our communities so that people will feel less afraid. We're not hesitant. We just don't want to do something that could end up harming us because in the past, this has been our experience. Right. And I would say that fear doesn't necessarily mean that you're ignorant or that you're right. uneducated. It could be responding to something that's very real. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that you've done a lot of that education. And I would also comment that I didn't mention before, but if you do have a primary care provider or a trusted friend who is in healthcare, talk to them, have that conversation mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they'll be able to assess it for your own particular circumstances, whatever conditions you might have. I know that for women of childbearing age, that's a concern. And I think some of that science is still emerging. We don't have all the answers yet, but I wanna segue into another <coughs> question. And I think this one will be, um, something that Dr. Shervington can comment about because we've had conversations about loss and um, grief and how her work in trauma has informed her ability to take care of people who've had devastating things happen. I know that you were down in New Orleans deep in it during Katrina. So we now have had the experience of COVID-19 for over a year. It was the third leading cause of death 
in the United States in 2020, and we've lost over half a million people, and that number continues to grow even though it's slowed down. Many of us are experiencing grief and loss as a result of this virus. Some of you have pointed out uh, that you've lost family or friends. I know that I lost a close friend early on. Uh, and as a nation, we've all been traumatized. So uh, what tips can you share with people to cope with this burden on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, thank you, Dr. Barnes. Yes, I was in New Orleans and I saw, I was part of helping a whole city recover. A city that the country, the government had forgotten, but civil society Americans turned up to help in the rebuilding of New Orleans. And I think that experience really made me a traumatologist. And so the first thing is to understand trauma, I think. It's the biologic response when we have an exposure that makes us think our survival is threatened like a hurricane, like a pandemic, or like for black people seeing the police have freedoms to kill us as they will to put their knees in our neck. It then biologically prepares us to, for survival, to be able to escape or to fight or to freeze, that we kind of know. So with the pandemic, I think we have to recognize that we are a little bit emotionally heightened, that we're a little more anxious, we're a little bit more I will use the word paranoid because we all kind of understand that some of us with some obsessive qualities, we probably find ourselves overdoing those obsessions a little bit more about being clean. But this is all the body's attempt to keep us safe. So to me, what's really important is to hold that anxiety, to know it's there, to know it's protective, but to learn how to manage it. And we have indigenous practices that comes from Buddhist philosophy that teaches us about mindfulness and presence, our breath, the importance of our breath. And I'm going to add not only the breath, but breathing through the nose that helps us to calm our bodies down more. And then attending to the grief, because as you've said, so many people we know have suffered or have died. And I would just share some, a few little tenets that I've learned over the years in terms of how to manage grief. The first is we need to accompany our grief. We need to know it's here with us. Then we need to kind of know it. How does grief turn up in our bodies? What happens in our mind? What happens in our bodies? We hold these emotions in our bodies. So we might begin to feel things we hadn't been feeling or have thoughts we weren't you know, we weren't aware of. So we really need to become really familiar with the grief. And then to me, the healing step is what would be the mourning, the acceptance of the loss. And to know that this is a part of life, but that we don't have to suffer. And within that ability to accept that these things have happened, and actually the grief is just in proportion to how much we've loved. So the more we've loved and we've cared is perhaps the more grief we're going to have. And to allow that to become a part of us, to allow our hearts to be broken by the pain, but then to build back up. And that's what I have been doing with myself, that I've done with friends, that in my professional work is really allowing these stages of grief that are not necessarily linear, but most important is to be able to accompany it, to know it, and then to liberate ourselves from the suffering by accepting that unfortunately this is a part of life. And I would add the more we've loved, the more we are going to experience loss when those loved ones are gone, but that we can make it through. So poignant. Thank you for those very helpful words to acknowledge, to accept, and then to know that you can build from it and, and move on. And I, I really appreciate uh, your sharing that. Um, other colleagues? That was so beautifully said. That was, that was so touching. Really? That was transformational. So I know. She's, yes. she's a tough act to follow, isn't she? Yes. Well, that I was, was just thinking, beautiful. one of the areas that we haven't touched on so much, and I know that Dr. Smith-White, you have some expertise. What about kids? Because I know that you do an enormous amount of work with children. And I'm just kind of trying to think, how do you even 
begin to explain something of this magnitude to a little one? You know, that's a good question. I think that it sort of is age dependent on how you're going to engage with children. Um, And it's hard to predict too, how children are going to react to stress. Um, You know, so certainly depending on your child's developmental stage and so forth, um, you're going to engage with them at a hopefully age appropriate level. But, you know, kids certainly are going to feel more stressed when they're directly involved if they have, you know, witnessed a person dying of COVID as I I unfortunately do know some children who have had that experience. Um, If they believe that a loved one is going to die, that sort of thing is going to be much more traumatizing for them. Um, you know, but how parents and or caregivers respond to their own stress levels is very important. What we model for them is is very important. And of course, you know, there are going to be cultural differences in the way that we deal with things. But, um, you know, so separation is going to be really important. The, you know, how we separate from our children, what we, uh, how we deal with it on a day-to-day basis, you know, going to work. If, if, for example, we are essential workers, what that does, to, you know, who we're living, leaving our children with as caregivers and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, what's really important is the familiarity and routine for them and, and, giving them a lot of support and, you know, just sort of realizing things are stage dependent. So, you know, if they're zero to two, they may not really know what's going on, but if you're super stressed or if they're seeing a lot of disaster images on TV or whatever, they may be just super cranky and, you know, need a lot of cuddling, that sort of thing. And Mm -hmm. whereas if they're, you know, three to six, they may have some regressive behaviors. They may, you know, revert to bedwetting. They may start wanting to sleep with you all the time, um, that sort of thing. And they, you know, may start sucking their thumbs again or having, you know, toileting accidents and, and that kind of thing as well. Um, tantrums, you know, just sleeping more poorly in general. And if they're maybe more in the seven to 10 range, um, you know, they're gonna feel angry, sad, um, have a lot of questions, you know, wonder what's going to happen, you know, and, and they may ask you questions that, that are, that seem, that are maybe more indirect, you know, so you have to sort of interpret what, what are they really fearful about, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to kind of figure out what's really in their mind and try to get to it in, in whatever way that you can, um, you know, their friends may sort of give them some, false information and you may have to re you know educate them in that regard um and you know they may or may not want to talk about things i mean it may just be difficult for them you know mm-hmm. teens and tweens or tweens let's start with them i guess mm-hmm. they will have more questions i think and again they may or may not want to talk about it that's a difficult age for sure you know the 12s and 11s and 13s and so forth Um, they may act out, they may, you know, be a little bit reckless, they may be, they may may become much more um, introverted, uh, also by contrast. Um, Some of them may use substances that can that can start happening, um, even in that age range, unfortunately. And, um, and certainly with teenagers, that can be an issue. Mm Um, you know, you can see, uh, and, but, but, but with them and with teenagers, you can have much more frank discussions about what's happening and, and try to, you know, I think that it's important you can express, you know, your grief with them, but again, you want to govern yourself a little bit so that you're not, you don't want to overwhelm them with your emotion as because you're still the parent, you know, so you want to show them that you have some coping skills and model that for them as well. Um, But also you have to think about the kids who have special needs because, you know, for them, if they've got, you know, if they've got some sort of, you know, intellectual disability, or if they've got, you know, if they're in a wheelchair, they've got, you know, that sort of thing, um, they may feel even, you know, that they have less control, they may be more worried. So for them, that could exacerbate, you know, whatever issues that they have going on and, you know, cause, you know, comorbid psychiatric disorders, um, you know, such as anxiety and depression. And I mean, this is for all of the kids and, you know, um, so these are all things to consider, you know, so we need to be on the lookout for 
um, substance abuse, we need to be on the lookout for, you know, suicidal thoughts or cutting behaviors or that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I think that there, there has been um, a lot more uh, depression in, in the tweens and teens and prob and, you know, younger kids as well. It's a lot more anxiety, a lot. It's been, it's been really hard for them. Um, you know, not the inability to really share their experiences with one another, um, in, in the close knit social circles, that, circles that they have, you know, it, it's not the same on social media to not have that human connection that we all mm -hmm. long for and miss so much. Um, so yeah, those are things that I would really, think about with kids. And I'm sure Dr. Shervington and, and you know, Ms. Perkins also have, you know, things well, that they may add to that, but I know that that was sort of a long-winded uh, Well, answer. thank you. You've given us sort of a age-appropriate <laughs> developmental <laughs> spectrum of different manifestations. And I, I guess I'm going to maybe not to put anybody on the spot, so I'll open it up. But, you know, so we identify these things that are happening, regressive behaviors, and mentioned that maybe they need a little bit more attention, but I guess at some point it might cross a line. And I, I grew up in a family where discipline was key. Um, I think aside from education, discipline was the other rule that my parents followed. But this seems like it might not be appropriate to really discipline or to come down you know, with a heavy hand if, if the child is struggling. But so at what point do you shift from being supportive to saying you need discipline or that you need help? And, and where is help available? If you could speak to that. I just want to add that we need, if for our African-American community, we need to be really clear about what we mean when we say discipline, yes. um, because Thank sometimes you. there is a little violence attached to that. And I think we need to debunk that, certainly setting expectations and boundaries with kids are appropriate, but never in anger hitting them or you know physically violating their space that's never helpful. Um, I 100% agree. In fact, I was thinking about the timeout, which mm -hmm. I, I wish that yes, my parents yes. had heard about uh, back <laughs> in the day. I'll just be candid. Right, too. Uh, I think that nowadays we have All more sophisticated <laughs> means of limit setting, limiting, yeah. restricting privileges, but, but not violence. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I will say that, you know, there's good and bad in all these experiences. What I have heard from the many young people I engage with, they have recognized the importance of human connection and touch. I think we were worried that they had become so much into technology and they still are, but I think they've come to learn the value of just human presence and touch and love in a way that sometimes we don't associate with. So I think that trying to enhance that component of young people's lives and to sit with them as they deal with what isolation, what isolation has taught them, I think that that is also very, very helpful to be able to affirm for them that they truly like being in human spaces with their friends and even those teachers they thought they didn't like that no they wish their teacher was there and so i think there's a way we can affirm for them the things that seems missing is such a good quality in them and that we will support that as best we can through the pandemic and the restrictions that we have i also think that we have an opportunity in families to change the busy dynamic of mm -hmm. um, when I grew up, um, we had dinner together. So through this pandemic, um, that um, reoccurred. Um, at the time when it first started, my son who was 27 at the time was still living at home. And we made it a point that at least two to three times out of the week, we would sit down as a family and have dinner. Um, it, it gave us an opportunity to kind of pull all of us together at the end of the day. Um, there's a new, well, maybe it's not too new, but it's new to me, new game out called Culture. And it's specifically for African-Americans. And it's all, Danielle, you're laughing. You've heard of it. Oh, I, I, I so need um, to try that. Yes. Um, it has all these different ap, um, acronyms and you have to figure out, someone will describe what it is. And it might be something like um, what goes on in this house stays in this house. And it'll just give you the acronyms and the, the, the crowd or the room full of people will have to figure out that. We started doing little things like that um, when we got together because the, our unit was small. Um, 
my son, my daughter and her husband, and uh, my sister, we all lived close to each other. Um, we all, we were the constant, we always saw each other. But to, to begin to try to build upon the fact that we couldn't go out and do all these different things anymore, we, we learned how to utilize what we did have. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so my son was a young adult, um, he began to play this over the phone, over with Zoom with his friends. Um, so you're right, um, people, people in general, we miss the connection. Um, African-Americans, we need our units. We do, we need our family. Um, just like the Hispanic community, they need their familia, they need their family. Um, so we, we found different ways to, to connect. Um, everything doesn't have to be a negative through this pandemic. We do what we are calling family church. Um, and we started it in March of 2020. And I have family members from Georgia, Florida, New York, um, Denver, of all these different places that get on this call for literally one hour. We use free Zoom and um, we all connect with each other. Talk about the week, we give a scripture or we just, and the people who aren't in church uh, just say something positive that helped them get through the week. But this is a new way that we wouldn't have been connecting with one another. Um, I think we, we had to go through this pandemic and realize that one, we are so resilient. We are resilient as a people, but how can we utilize the tools that we already have in us um, to get through this and to come out stronger? And I think um, we've made more efforts to reach out to people that you wouldn't normally, I wouldn't normally talk to my cousins in Florida every week. Um, but because of the pandemic and because of Zoom, we now do that um, and just check in with individuals. I think we have to take out the positive out of our final silver lining in it. And with our young people in the Department of Mental Health up in Service Area 1, we really reached out to different high schools to see how they were struggling. And we put together virtual scavenger, scavenger hunts, anything to engage young people so that um, they would feel connected um, to one another and to each other. There's all types of um, games on Pinterest that people can do to stay connected with one, an with one another. I'm not seeing all my girlfriends, but we get together once a month on Zoom. And you know whatever you can do to stay connected, I think we, we have to, to seek that connection. It's not gonna just happen. Um, and I think that's a way to, to engage model that for our young people and for our, even our, in our children. Oh, excellent feedback. Thank you all. I want to just add that, you know, some of us are lucky enough to have established family that we communicate with and that we can get into a room and actually get along harmoniously. But I want to point out that not every listener has that luxury. And I think in that case, you have to really think carefully about what is the family that I create? Um, I know that right. old expression is you can choose your friends, but not your family. And I always took that as an advantage that, um, you know, sometimes you have to think about where I am. If you're a transplant, like I didn't grow up in Southern California, so I've had to create my own network. Um, I know that there are many people who feel like they're alienated from family. Members of the LGBTQ plus community sometimes have been put out. Um, and so then you have to come up with the adopted family that serves Absolutely. your needs. And so if you don't have it by birth, if you don't have it in your immediate environment, think about who are the trusted confidants that you can spend important time with and then make time to spend time with them. So I'm going to move on to our next question. Um, this week, LA County has moved from the orange tier as the number of cases has steadily declined. This means that more and more businesses are reopening and preparing to reopen and of course there's traffic again. Despite mm -hmm. this, there is still a need to remain vigilant and to maintain personal safety. How would you suggest people manage the stress of re-entry, particularly into the workplace and also into social spaces like, like dating, you know, in a time of COVID where everybody's been in their cave now, there's this idea that now some, suddenly they're kind of emerging, they're beginning to come out, that, you know, they want to get busy in more ways than one. What type of advice would you give people, especially with young adults? I think this is so important. Recently, we've been seeing evidence about spring breaks happening. And in California, we're fortunate that our cases have gone low. They're remaining low. We have a, rem, a, a, a ambitious vaccine program. But if you're thinking about getting on a plane and traveling all over the place and doing kind of things, well, what, what, what would you all say about this reopening and how people should approach it? Get vaccinated. <laughs> Let's start there. 
get vaccinated and proceed preca um, precautiously and mm -hmm. proceed with precaution. Um, I, I, I've been married almost 36 years, so I don't have any clue to say anything about dating. <laughs> I don't know. I I do not know how I would proceed with that. I'd almost want to say, "Are you vaccinated?" <laughs> For the card. Show me your card. Yeah. 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 Show me your card. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know on that one. You know, honestly. I I think this takes us back. It takes me back to the early days of HIV disease, um, and you know, for people who have to be living with HIV, I think this virus has kind of resurfaced. And then of course, Dr. Fauci, who was there with that virus, virus is here again. So I just wanna acknowledge that for certain communities, um, communities that are immune suppressed for whatever reasons that the, the fear is real. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I remember, I, the, as you say, get vaccinated, or whatever, it's like, what's your status? And it's not as easy as, and so it gives me so much compassion thinking about people who've had to be living with conditions where they've had to figure out, you know, what's your status? Can we interact socially? Can we connect physically? Mm -hmm. And I think we're just gonna have to get comfortable with that. We're gonna have to, be willing to assert our need to know. So have you been vaccinated? Are you being um, abiding by the public health recommendations to mask, to wash and to distance? I think we're just gonna have to be able to ask those questions and be willing to have it asked of us. Mm -hmm. I got a little funny one day when someone kind of, you know, said to me, have you been vaccinated? And it's like, oh my God, so I, it is, it's not easy, but this is yeah. the new way we have to be to survive our current circumstance, I think. And I echo that completely. I've had some interactions with some people. It's so funny um, where we were getting together for one reason or another. And each of us said, I've been vaccinated by the way, you know, <laughs> that was part of our introduction. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think that that is just going to be part of the way that we do things. And, and I, again, would, you know, agree completely with what Theon was saying about just, we need to remain vigilant. I mean, that's just, we've got these variant strains now, which, mm -hmm. you know, again, the vaccines are protective against them as far as, you know, you and perhaps you could still get COVID, um, but you are, have, you know, much less chance of dying from it, thank God. So, um, you know, this UK variant strain right now, which is, you know, growing. Um, and, you know, so I think that it's, it's really important to let people know about that. And, you know, but I think that the fact that um, we just have to let people know that we can win this battle if we empower ourselves with good, healthy practices. I mean, you know, all the things that we already know, I mean, disinfecting um, more than we previously would have done in the past, obviously wearing masks and or the um, masks or um, face shield. Thank you, Shield, because I totally forgot what that meant, well, what that was. Um, you know, getting our regular checkups, that sort of thing, um, washing our hands, you know, getting our vaccinations, even if you're, for whatever reason, are not able to get your COVID-19 vaccination, get your meningitis vaccination if you're going to college and you can get that one right now or get your, you know, pneumococcal vaccination against, uh, you know, pneumonia, f f if you can do that right now, get your um, uh, herpes zoster, your um, shingles vaccine, get that, get those things taken care of as well. Um, limit your social contacts to people who are, you know, sort of pre-vetted by your, you know, social contacts, your family members, whatever. Um, and, you know, really think about others, think about your neighbor by pr practicing good hygiene and, and that's for yourself as well, of course, but I, I think that that's just really important and try to limit your use of alcohol and drugs because of course we become disinhibited if we are using, you know, so we want to make sure that we keep that to a minimum. I mean, you know, certainly if you're in a safe circle, you know, in your home with your very best friends and you want to let loose and just 
you know, chitty chat, whatever, that's one thing. <laughs> but, you know, if you're going out to a bar mm -hmm. and you're drinking heavily and that you don't know, I mean, you may engage or be, have some behaviors that you would not otherwise have and then be less safe. And then you don't know what you could expose yourself to besides COVID, right? We all know about that. So, um, so I think that's really important. And, you know, again, I mean, we want to get back to having our, our face to face interactions are that have that human energy and dynamic and all of that. So this is, these are steps on the way to to having whatever our eventual new normal will be. But I think that that's really, those are all really important things to keep in mind. So thank you. I would just add that the information is a shifting sand. I think it's based on the best medical and scientific information that we have at the time. But because we're accruing new information by the day about mm -hmm. this virus and what the safety things are, I know that right now there's information about masking if you're vaccinated or not, or if you're meeting with other unvaccinated people. So mm -hmm. definitely pay attention to those things, but then it's gonna be risk that you need to stratify according to your unique situation. I think about the 20 somethings who really, you know, I feel sometimes bad for them because they feel like we're the last in line, but we now have, been told by the government that by the end of May, the vaccine should be available to everybody. But of course, there's going to be enormous demand. So you have to think about, well, I want to get vaccinated, but until I am, it's going to be safer for me to meet up with the date, maybe to go rollerblading or to go for a walk in the park or go to an outdoor cookout than to have them over to my house um, when things okay. are going to get personal more quickly. And to think about having a longer boundary between you and the physical intimacy that we all, I think, mostly need and enjoy. But to think about in a time of COVID, the pandemic isn't over. And until you are protected, I also want to emphasize the role of testing, which also kind of harkens back to HIV. You know, there was a period of time when people would talk very openly about, I got my test, did you get yours? And if it's someone who's in a status where you can't get vaccinated yet, then I think if you're putting yourself at risk or if you have a job where you can't just isolate, to go and get tested frequently is available more so now than it was at the beginning of all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think it still plays a role. We need to do that surveillance testing. Um, so I'm gonna move on to our, our last question. Um, surviving trauma and community violence, including domestic terrorism, which we're seeing a lot of particularly anti-Black violence. And before this, uh, I think recently there have been anti-Asian violence. And I know that KJLH has a variety of listeners from all different backgrounds because they, they come up and tell me that they've been listening to the show. So for our Asian American friends and, and relatives and colleagues, we know that this isn't new for us, but some of them, I think, because they have been an invisible minority, may be confronting this in a public way for, for the first time. So I just wanted to put a, a, a feeler out to talk about, we as, I mean, all of us are African-American or African origin or Caribbean. What are our thoughts about how we can learn from previous events that we've experienced in our communities? And I would say that the Latinx community isn't immune from this as well. Um, there are parts of our city where there is stigma and discrimination uh, that is sometimes unfortunately based on skin tone or, or language spoken. But how do we protect our minds and bodies uh, from this type of domestic terrorism? Uh, just quick thoughts. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have a great answer for that, but I, I mean, I think that, you know, just having human empathy for one thing, you know, put yourself in anyone else's shoes. You know, if you see something, um, speak up, don't, just, don't stand there silently because just by standing there and not doing anything, you become complicit. You're allowing that sort of thing to be perpetuated, um, you know, when people were lynching black men and women, um, oftentimes probably usually men, um, and other people were watching and knowing that these men were innocent of whatever random ridiculous crime that they were coming up with and accusing them of, you know, even if they were not actively, you know, the ones who were hanging the man and, you know, beating him and doing whatever, to his body, violating him prior to murdering him, they were complicit in that act. And as they stood around and took pictures with his body, they were complicit. And the people who uh, watch someone attack an Asian person on the street and do nothing and don't call the police and don't, you know, at least say stop, you know, if they're afraid that they may be attacked 
by this other person, they, they become uh, silently complicit. You know, I think that that's really important. I mean, what if that was your grandmother? What if that was your sister, cousin, brother, child, or you? You know, I think that it's so important to be able to, you know, see yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's, I mean, again, part of the human condition is to to be able to to look at people in that way. And, and I feel like, you know, that's something that this, a lot of people in this country seem to have you know, forgotten or lost right in, in, in recently. I'll just say that there's been a lot of loss of empathy and compassion and, um, but I mean, I think that, you know, so right now it's been, it's been really, it's been tough to observe all of the, you know, the January 6th uh, and all of this anti-Asian violence, you know, and then of course the lifetime of anti-Black violence, of course, you know, I mean, and the historical, I mean, let's go, let's just go on and on. But um, yeah, so that's, that would be my sort of first thought about it. Um, so, and I'm sure. There's much more that can be said about that. Thank you for making the association with lynching. I this weekend, fortunately or unfortunately, watched this amazing film by a Black woman documentary, Always in Season, um, that lynching continues to be a part of the culture um, as recent as 2014. And we know there were some incidents in California during the previous administration that we're not sure what happened. And I think what, and you know, as I watched her depict what you said, what people observing the bystanders who were eating or cheering this along, I recognize that there must be some spiritual deficiency in people, a lack of just love of humanity and caring. How, how can you, how can you be a part of that? And so what I've, I'm trying to do, and it's so difficult, it's a very Buddhist thing to send loving kindness to those who perhaps are not exactly in the space we would like them to be, not to excuse them and to hope that they will understand that we have a responsibility as a human community to care for and respect each other. And so I know that for those of us who've been oppressed, we sometimes engage in certain behaviors, but sometimes they seem more reactive to me. So, um, you know, I would, for, for my group that I'm a part of, I am also sending loving kindness, hoping that in our struggles, we can be hopeful. And some of our own ways in which we are aggressive, we can begin to minimize. But certainly, whatever white supremacy is, there's a real deficit in loving human compassion and caring. And I think we are going to have to support in any way, whether it's me just meditating or if people pray or groups get together, we support. They're going to have to tap back into their humanity. Without that, we're going to be having these conversations. Mm -hmm. My response to this is, is um, to acknowledge it, to acknowledge um, that hurt and that pain, mm -hmm. um, to have discussions about it. Um, I know when Trayvon Martin um, was killed, my son was um, similar in age and I, I just felt so overwhelmed. Um, and my mother who was from New Orleans, um, Yay. Um, I yes yes and I'm, I'm actually from there as well I'm actually from there as well um I, I went to her um, after a day of work and and I was just in tears and what she said to me was we are resilient and yes this is wrong it's wrong all types of ways um but I need you to draw on the strength that we have been through so much worse um, she said, you're not living in the time when you had to step off the sidewalk um, just because you weren't the right color. Um, my mother is, is pretty fair. And as a baby, I was born pretty fair. I've been in California in the desert, so I'm pretty red now. 
Um, but I was born with very, very light eyes. And um, once at the train station, she said, um, um, a, a, a Caucasian woman asked her, that baby should be mine. And she said, um, she never forgot that. Um, and she said, oh, no, ma'am, she's mine and, and hurried away. And she said, you live in an ent entirely different time. And so she, she made me put it in the context. Yes, what you're seeing is wrong, but what we've already been through is are the shoulders that we can stand on and say, oh, we will get through this. And you're right, we have to channel love. We have to channel compassion because if we don't, that hatred and that anger will rot us out. Those microaggressions will kill us. Um, that's why you have African-Americans that are healthy, physically healthy, but they have hypertension. All those microaggressions um, that have gone on in their lives. Um, it's, it's important for me every day to channel peace and know that light really will overshadow darkness every day, no matter what. Um, and it, it's an effort. It's, it's not something easily done, but I take it consciously every day that I'm going to show love no matter what, so. And that is a great place to be. I, I wanna take a moment because we're about at our hour to thank each and every one of you and also KJLH for making it possible for us to come together with this panel to talk about real issues and um, everything from breathing and loving kindness to hot Fritos, um, hot Cheetos, <laughs> hot nachos. I'm, I'm not gonna let that go, Theon. You can't take that away from me. But I think we should take a moment for a collective breath because we've dealt with some really difficult topics. And if we could just all like take a moment to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. And I, um, want to also point out that if you are struggling with something, if you have something going on in your life, you do not have to be alone. If you go to the DMH website, that's the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, it's dmh.lacounty.gov. You'll see resources about coronavirus. You'll see ways to access help. There are various helplines that are peer support lines. There are professionals. There are volunteers through different partnership organizations that we have that can answer your call 24 seven in English and Spanish, and they will get you to other languages if needed as well. And then there's also our number. If you don't have internet access, you can dial us. DMH helpline is 800. 8517771. Write that down. We'll try to post it. I really want to thank you all for listening in and um, have a great, wonderful rest of your day or year. The Radio Free 102.3 KJLH 21st Annual Women's Health Expo brought to you virtually by the City of Long Beach and Fresno County Black Infant Health Program.